Lance, what's up, dude? What's going on, man? Nothing, man. Just uh, got a little workout in the garage. Made my kids some French toast, and now gonna sit out here, sit outside, chop it up with you a little bit. What are you up to? There you go. I just dropped one of the cars off at the shop. I actually had to go get some stuff done today. Uh, it's kind of weird being at home this long. Usually, I, I would have been in fight camp by now. I would have been about a six weeks out from my fight. So I'm just getting stuff done at home. I'm actually taking this time to, you know, capitalize on a lot of things I need to get done at the house, Absolutely. the yard, and stuff like that. Yeah, I think Julie has like a daily schedule for me. I think today we got to clean out the basement. We got to finish like the rec room and stuff. So, you know, it's <laughs> there easy. You, go. you know how it is, man. Once you're in a house, especially with you, you're you're only home so often. You leave and go to camp, so it's really easy to put painting and all this other bullshit off. So while, while we're on the subject, though, why don't you explain to everyone kind of how, like you were out at Team Alpha Male for years, lived there, trained there, all that stuff year-round, but explain to people how your camp is set up now, what you do. Um, so now, since 2017, I've been in um, Columbus, Ohio. Like That's where my wife and I live, but I do my fight camps in New Jersey, and I was in uh, Las Vegas for a year, and I trained out there for one of the camps. And then um, this this last year for season two of PFL, I was in um, New Jersey for my camp. So I would do my fight camp out there, and then I'd be in Columbus for the time in between. And for the PFL season, there's not much time in between, honestly. So I'd be home for a few weeks, and then I'd go right back out to fight camp for – six to eight weeks depending on how close the fight was to my last fight and then uh it works out really well though because i can drive home on the weekends it's only an eight hour drive and i'm used to driving i've i've always been somebody who likes to get in the car blast music and drive so it's not that bad for me well and the good thing is too um you know when you are at home you probably have the best basement gym setup i've ever seen it's, it is it's, nice it's amazing I mean, it, the thing is too is it's not it's not like some elaborate, like huge gym either, because our house is decent size, but the basement, it's in the basement. And it's really, it's only half of what our basement square footage is. So I, I tried to save some of the other square footage for mat space since I have mats down there. Um, but I mean, it, we have everything we need to get the job done. So this quarantine really hasn't affected me that much, to be honest. Right. Yeah. I See, I, I have like a small workout area in my basement. I have some weights in my garage now, which normally I don't have weights in my garage because I just lifted old school. But I brought yeah. some, you know, 100-pound dumbbells home and stuff. And then I have my stuff out in the yard, which you've trained with us out here in the yard before. I got my pull-up bars and dip bars and stuff. So yeah. I'm still able to get great workouts in every day, but mine's kind of spread out. But, yeah. you know, with you, you've got a power rack down there. you got your bike down there so you can do your training lab stuff. You got yeah. really all the essentials, dumbbells, everything. So Yeah, treadmill. I got sauna, treadmill heavy bag, double end bag. I mean, I really set it up and that's been like a progression of years too, because I had a double end bag when I lived in a townhouse in Westerville and that was all I had there. So I'd go hit that in the garage when we first moved back to Columbus and we had no weights or anything at the house. Like I, I did a lot of Hoover workouts with you and we'd work out at old school or OSU. So I didn't really have any weights until I moved into this last house and since once you own a house, you kind of realize that you're you're allowed to buy things that are going to last you a long time. Right. When you when you rent your whole <laughs> life, like when I lived in Virginia Tech in California, like we knew we weren't staying long term in those places because we weren't we didn't own them. But I think once you own a house or own a condo or whatever, you kind of you put more money into the things that you have there just because you know it's it's got to last yeah, we, you a long time. We, we call those boat anchors, you know? <laughs> yeah. You, you don't want a boat anchor if you live in an apartment somewhere and you got to move every year and then you got to lug that sauna out of the place or whatever because <laughs> then it just turns into a pain in the ass. But Exactly. And, and you think when you lived in New Albany, you had that double end bag, but your neighbors that you were connected to, if you would have hung up a heavy bag, they would have been bitching, you know, the, the noise from it, the vibration and stuff. So that's what – one of the many you know benefits of owning a home is you can kind of do things that you know you only have to answer to you so if jesse doesn't want to hear you hit the heavy bag she can go outside or whatever you know dude the funny thing is actually i have an american bully as you know and he's a yeah. nut job and <laughs> i hang his toys from the spot in the basement and he'll hang from it and like 
really yell and squeal and bark the whole time while he's hanging from it. I used to do that in the garage at the townhouse, and my one neighbor would be like, is everything all right over there? And then once once he realized that it was just our dog, just like I would never do it late at night. I would always do it like during the day, but he would always be like, is everything okay? And then once he realized the dog was just in there playing on his rope, he'd be like, oh, okay, it's just the crazy dog in the garage again. You should have just told him, like, hey, Jesse gets kind of rowdy on weekend, weekends, you know. It's just <laughs> Yeah, I got to tie her up in the garage to keep her from <laughs> hurting me. <laughs> That's classic. Well, I'll tell you, one thing I wanted to talk to you about, have you watched Tiger King yet? Oh, yeah. You, If you haven't seen it, you like, I don't know what's wrong with you. You have to. <laughs> I'm like, I think I'm five episodes into it. So I've been, I've been watching it while I do my bike workouts in the basement. So nice. it is, it is amazing. Now for anyone, most people already know the story, but for anyone that doesn't know, kind of give us a quick rundown. Like you grew up in that animal trainer world, you know, your dad, you know, helped take care of an exotic animals and stuff. You guys did the shows. Give us a quick little glimpse of that. Well, the crazy thing about it is too, is once you've seen Tiger King, and me coming from that, like, since I was, before I was born, my dad was involved in the wild, like, exotic animal business. So when you come from that your whole life, all these people are exactly the same. Like, <laughs> Doc, Doc Antle is no different from Joe Exotic other than the fact that he has his shit together a little bit more. Right. He can yeah, talk. he seemed like a better businessman out of the two. Exactly. That's That's really the only difference. And we've known Doc for years, and he was one of the only people in the – us to have a liger but way back in like the early 90s like when ligers were still like a unicorn and nobody really knew what they were right um but yeah one like growing up i was i grew up around bears mostly and then we had uh tigers then we had lions and we had leopards and wolves and we just we just kept adding animals to the the collection basically and we were considered an animal rescue so not all of our animals were um animals that we had bought from a breeder some of them we rescued some of them were just people couldn't take care of them so we would take over and bring them to the facility we had 23 acre facility with a pond and a bunch of different pens for different animals that some could be together some had to be just solitary their entire life um, kind of like an animal same thing as like a, a, a dog and cat rescue facility some dogs can be around other dogs some dogs can't and that's just kind they, of they all had their own was. personality then exactly yeah so did you guys did you guys ever have any dealings with or know the guy in zanesville the kind of infamous thing that happened there where he this guy had all those animals he let them all loose and then shot himself and then it just it turned into a, a massacre essentially yeah it was the thing that was sad about it and i don't really know the the real story, but the story that I got was that his ex-wife was just watching the animals while he was in prison. So they didn't have to be taken away. And then when he came home from prison, she was leaving and he thought that she was going to stay. So he was depressed or something. That was what I heard. But either way, all the animals got let loose and the, obviously the highway patrol and the Columbus those guys, those guys aren't, those guys aren't equipped or trained to be able to capture tigers and take them back to the zoo like they're not exactly they never dealt with that and they didn't have enough ammo for tranquilizer darts at the zoo and they couldn't get out there quick enough so a lot of the animals had to be killed just because of the safety of everybody around that like there was there was like leopards and cougars on route 33 going down towards <laughs> athens and stuff like it was crazy yeah just like running through people like rural neighborhoods and stuff yeah yeah yeah, I, I still remember when that happened. What a wild, what a wild time. So, but did you guys ever know that guy, or just know of him, or he was just kind of a? There's lots of guys out there like that. I guess it's kind of the the gist I got. Yeah, in Ohio before, so before the Zanesville thing happened, there was a lot of people in Ohio that had that, and then there was a lot of people that after the thing in Zanesville happened, the USDA just came in and they're like, we give you, we're giving you 14 days to get rid of all the animals and get them to a safe place or we're going to do it for you. And that was kind of, that was kind of the end of our run. And that was, that was the way it ended. They would, they came in with however many big cages they could get and just took the animals and took them to, um, like there's a bear resort in Denver, Colorado that some of our bears are at. Some zoos have some of our animals. That was just what they, they, did, did any of them go to the, on. uh, 
did any of them go to the wilds that place out by cambridge i don't i don't know for sure i don't is that just a bear facility or is it other ones no so they it's this huge i forget how many hundreds of acres it is but they take in animals like once they're basically kind of like retired from the zoos oh gotcha and they're out there just kind of like roaming free and then they i think they have big barns that they sleep in but you can go out there and book like almost like a safari tour where you nice. drive you know through the fields in the summertime and stuff and uh you can just see them you know there's you know bears tigers elephants everything just out there it's right out by cambridge so yeah yeah i've never uh honestly like we stayed to ourselves but we knew doc because he would always come up to the cleveland sportsman show and we both did that show together and he would bring a lot of his big cats and that was back when we just had bears so that was kind of how we got into the big cat game was because of doc and this right. lady in texas who used to breed tigers and so it was, it was pretty crazy though it was true that you could buy a tiger so cheap back then i tell you what was even more crazy to me than the people buying tigers was at the very beginning i think it was the first episode of how he found the tiger breeders people were buying like cobras and like venomous <laughs> snakes like why the fuck why the fuck would you want a cobra you that's know? what like, i'm that, saying that to me is crazier it's it's not something like a venomous snake is you look at people who have like venomous snakes and they're into that. That's like, that's a whole other world of weird people outside from the big cat people. And they're all the same. So it's like, it's very <laughs> like all those people are so similar. Like if you meet one person that has venomous snakes, then you probably know what the other people that own venomous snakes are going to be like. <laughs> yeah. It would take a, take a certain type of personality for sure. I mean, I, like a big cat, I could see you would want to play with it and touch it. They're beautiful. There would be a personality too, but a snake, a venomous snake, like, I don't know. It just it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, I bet it's some weirdos for sure. Yeah, it's like the the danger of it is what attracts people, I guess. Like, telling people that you have these dangerous things because just like in that movie, like, it attracts people. You say you have a tiger when that guy was taking those baby tigers to Vegas and people get yeah. paid and go up to – it's like that guy's a weirdo just as much as the other ones. Just because he has money doesn't make him any different. <laughs> right. All right. So, shifting gears. I mean, I could probably talk about Tiger King all day. I'm sure you. Could. Oh yeah, we can go on and on. There's so many different. <laughs> there's so many different aspects to that. Without like even not even in the in the movie or documentary, but just that whole situation alone. Like I could go on for days and days because there's so many. There's so many different aspects that you can just, like, key in on and go over for an entire day. It's insane. <laughs> well, switching back to the uh, to the PFL. So, if any, anyone that's watching is not familiar with the PFL, so Lance, the two-time defending world champ, and what makes it different than, you know, Bellator or UFC is you guys actually have a season yeah. where it's almost yeah. like, you know, and it funnels into a bracket, and then you have – is it the, the quarters and the semifinals on the same night, right? Yep, they're about you fight about an hour apart from each other, which is really cool. So it's kind of a th uh, you know it's kind of a throwback to the original days of MMA, but with this new new school structure over. You have rankings and everything else, and if you win both those fights, you win your your quarter in the semifinal, then you fight on New Year's Eve for a million dollars, and that's kind of turned into our new tradition at our house with the kids as we watch you win a million bucks every New Year's <laughs> Eve. You know when 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 the kids were younger. You know, my mom would come up and watch, and me and Julie would still go out or something. Well, now they're kind of at that age. They want to they want to hang out with us. And yeah. in a few more years, it'll be like they'll want to go out and, like, sneak out and go drink beer with their friends or whatever. <laughs> but for right now, they want us to stay home with them. So for the last two years, it's, we stay home, and we watch Lance fight. That's like our New Year's tradition. So That's awesome. Now, the, the season normally would start in, what, June? Yeah, May or June. I fought last year in May. The first season was in June, okay. and this fight was supposed to be – this was supposed to be, honestly, May 21st. So I would have already been a couple weeks into fight camp by now, so it's kind of weird. What what kind of official word have they given you? I mean, I've seen stuff about Dana White's been trying to secure a private island to do fights and this and that. What is the What has the PFL been saying? PFL just said for everybody to sit tight and – um, just like everybody else, I mean, the, on, the biggest thing, I like what Dana's trying to do, but it's just not realistic. And, <laughs> right. And we've already found that out because Disney shut it down last week. So, uh, like, it's just not a realistic thing. And I don't care what, I don't care what types of things you're doing for the safety, but 
it's really not safe for anybody if if this is just if this is as serious as everybody is making it out to be it's not it's not any safer for the fighters to go on a private island all they're going to do is be quarantined there with somebody who has it and give it to everybody else when they come home it, no it's really not going to do anything differently from being on a private island to just doing it at the you know at the apex in vegas which they already own so i don't know why they wouldn't do it there anyway well it'd be just a skirt skirt around the you know the local regulations or whatever i mean yeah. i kind of thought the same thing if you think back i mean it seems like it was half a year ago but you know the arnold that was only a little bit over a month ago yeah and like at the last minute they canceled the expo to all the vendors like us with max ever muscle and all these other other vendors but they still had the athletes compete so yeah. on one hand that was good for the athletes but on the other hand all right i remember saying thinking okay if this thing is really that serious then shut the whole thing down. You got 20,000 athletes that are still coming into Columbus. They're still bringing their coaches and their parents and all this other stuff. So if the goal is, hey, we got to shut down the expo for everyone's safety, then you shut the whole thing down, you know? Yeah. So I think doing all these, these half-assed measures are just going to prolong it that much longer. It really is. And I think if, you're, if you really want to get rid of this thing faster, if it doesn't have all these other strands like the regular flu and come back every year, just let people live like the people who have the health issues and the people who are uh, not able to fight this off and be able to live through it. Those people need to stay at home and everybody else can just like if they need to quarantine, that's fine. But everybody else should just be able to move on with their life. Because in my opinion, from everything that's been in the media, even though the media is kind of swayed in certain ways and it's not really true news sometimes, but from everything that's been in the media, you don't really know. They don't really know if this is really lowering the bell curve or if it's even doing anything. All it's doing is slowing the process. And then it, by the time summer hits, we're going to have this giant uh, influx when everybody's back to normal life. Well, I think we're not going to know one way or another until they roll out widespread testing. Until exactly. everyone can get tested, I number one, we're not going to know the true extent. And number two, it's really not safe for anyone to kind of come out of it. So I think, to your point, if we can, if we can start getting things back to normal and let you know, people that aren't have, a, you know, have immune compromise and things like that kind of get out and start living their life again, we, we got to have testing. So that way, if someone does contract it, you know, let's say I'm, I'm young and healthy and I can track it. I need to know. So that way I don't give it to my grandma or to my mom or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know what the answer is, but it's going to be interesting. So I agree. I agree that testing for everybody will definitely make a difference because then at least, you know, you can quarantine for 14 days or whatever it is. And right. most healthy people can get through it without any type of, um, without any type of hospitalization from what I've been told or from the things that I've heard. So, um, I don't know. It, it's a weird situation for everybody. This is a, it's a adaptation process for everybody in the world. So it's interesting to see how some people handle it. So the craziest thing I've heard so far, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it hasn't really affected me personally yet. Like I don't, you know, know anyone really directly involved in my life that has or anything, but me there's either. a girl that I know from high school, went to the high school next to mine. She was a year younger than me. Her brother was my age. So she's 40 years old, right? She lives down in Florida now. Now, I, I probably haven't seen this girl since high school. It wasn't like I was good friends with her. I just know her, right? So she's 40 years old, lives down in Florida. Natasha Tony was her name. She's pregnant. She, she catches the coronavirus while she's pregnant. They have to put her into quarantine. She has the baby while she's in quarantine. So no one can even see her and give birth or anything. They have to take the baby away, and she dies two days later in quarantine. Four Dang. years old. Crazy, right? So I, yeah. I, mean, I don't know what her health situation was or anything. My guess is her body was just vulnerable because of being pregnant and going through labor and all that. Yeah. But imagine to think, you know, what her family is going through. You know, here she is, 40 years old. It's her first kid. And, uh, you know, die two days after giving birth from the coronavirus. And she never, I don't even, the way I understood it, like they had to take the baby away immediately to keep the baby from catching it. So kind of that's, that's the kind of most heartbreaking thing I've heard from anyone even remotely located to me. So anyway, not to, not to bring a big, you know, bummer down on our conversation, but. Um, yeah, it's, it's a weird thing. Everybody's got a, I mean, luckily the baby's healthy, but then that raises another question of, who raises the baby unless she has a husband that is around and like, there's a lot of weird stuff that's happening with this thing. And 
we really don't know. Like, if somebody's immunocompromised and they don't know that they have something, like right. immune, immune disorder or something, they may not know that they have that until they get this, and then it's too late at that point to even be able to treat it just because, I don't know, I have no idea. I'm not a doctor. I'm not an infectious disease doctor, but it doesn't seem like they really know what the fuck's going on either. Well, there's a, there's a lot of unknowns, and I think that's probably – a good point to pivot on is neither one of us are doctors. So we really don't know what the hell we're talking about. Just putting our opinions out there. <laughs> well, even the, even the doctors don't know what they're talking about. So right. I guess we're all right. right. <laughs> all right. So I, I put something up yesterday on my story and said, if anyone wanted to DM me questions for you or whatever. Um, and of course I got some stupid ones, but there was one really good one that I wanted to ask you. And I thought this was good. So and it was, it's kind of, kind of a long one, but so over the years, you think about, you know, you've been involved with, you know, you were kind of integral part of, you know, legendary program in, at St. Ed's. Then you, you know, you wrestled at Ohio State, four-time All-American there, and you were part of that group along with, you know, Reese and JD and Mikey that kind of brought Ohio State wrestling from the fringes to the forefront. You guys were kind of, you know, trailblazers there. Then from there, you went to Team Alpha Male and started fighting. You went to Vegas for a while. You, you, know, you and I have trained a lot together over the years at OSU and, um, you know, at old school gym. And now, now you work with the training lab, another world renowned thing. And you go to New Jersey. So you've been all over the place with high level coaches, story programs everywhere. And the, this guy's question was, what's the one thing, whether it's a, a strength workout, a conditioning workout or whatever that you've always done, that you've always loved and you feel like you always do no matter where you're at. Um, <laughs> as far as conditioning, I feel like it's the airdyne bike. That's a pretty easy, easy answer. That's I feel something like that, that's always going to be something you always do, no matter what. It's all no matter how good a shape you're in, it's always going to get you tired. And no matter how, no matter what stage of life, like I started doing the airdyne when I was like 10 years old, and I'm 33 years old, and the airdyne is still the hardest conditioning I've ever done. So you can never you can never beat the airdyne. No, you only get better, and then it gets harder. So. Right. The better you get at it, the higher condition you get, the harder it gets because you keep elevating. So, I mean, there's there's a lot of other things you can do, but I've always had the aerodyne as, like, that's my gauge for whether I'm in tip-top shape is if I can do this on the aerodyne or if I can do this for this long on the aerodyne. It's like it, that's the easiest way to kind of gauge your, your conditioning. Obviously, running conditioning is different from the bike. Wrestling is different conditioning from the bike. Fighting is different from the bike. But on the aerodyne, I, I have a good gauge. Like, if I can do this or if I can do these intervals or if I can hit this many RPMs for this long, this many times, like, that's always been the best gauge that I've had. And that's that's got to be the only thing that – like, if that's the only thing I had in a quarantine, I'd be okay with it. <laughs> I, I, I have certain benchmarks that I use on the Airdyne as well. I have, the, I have the Echo at my house. What do you have? You have the Assault bike or the Echo? Or, I have the have Echo swim, bike. Right? You have the Echo? I have the, yeah, I have the Echo also. When I, I messaged you a while back about if there's any differences between, like, an actual Airdyne brand, a Schwinn or a Echo or the other one because just depending on, like, how fast – I don't know, or how wide the fan is or whatever. I feel like that would make a difference on your speed. Yeah, even, even the stride length with your arms, all that stuff makes a difference for sure. So, mm -hmm. for example, I have the Echo at my house, but then I have the assault bikes at my gym. And some some days I feel like one's harder than the other. They're pretty similar, but, like, the assault bike, your arms don't move quite as far, so I feel it more in my legs. The Echo, yeah. you have, like, a bigger, you know, bigger pull with your arms. So I feel it a little bit less on my legs, but overall it's harder on my wind. So yeah, it's kind of, but I, I feel like those two are really similar that I, I have one of the old, old aerodynes at my dad's house, which nice. it, the calibration on that one's all off, but, <laughs> um, but no, so what's, I have certain benchmarks that I use with my, what's one of the benchmarks that you use for your conditioning on the aerodyne or on the echo or whatever. Well, it, it used to be like high school and college, it would be like 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off for like 15 or 20 minutes. So you have 15 or 20, 30 second goes, but you're trying to keep it up at 80 or 85 RPMs the entire time during that 30, but you have a 30 second rest. But, but that also, 30 second rest feels like nothing. 
No, it feels like it feels like the thirty second rest is fifteen, and the thirty second go is forty five. Right. It's like it always feels like that, and the first one's always super easy, and you're like, man, like maybe I can go harder on this one. Then the second one hits, and you're like, oh shoot, that lactic acid builds up super fast, and you're just trying to crush through it. But the the interval ones are the ones that we've always done. Like even in wrestling in high school and college, it's always been like. 30 second goes or 2020s or um, 2010s or 10 on 20 off or 20 on 10 off just like just switching it up but that's always been the ones where I've known like this is like I'm in great shape if I can hold that for 80 rpms or 85 the whole time during those goes yeah so I used to do a lot of them where I would do like a one-to-one -one like that like 20 seconds on 20 off or 10 on 10 off but what happens with that is, I mean, most of the time you start to kind of drop after a few of them just because that recovery is not enough. Unless so Wayne the that, Pain's watching you. What's that? <laughs> Unless Wayne the Pain's watching, you don't drop when that happens. Right. No, no, of course not. Yeah, buddy. Uh, <laughs> but so now a lot of times if I do, you know, a shorter interval like that, maybe I'll do a little bit longer rest. But my favorite workouts to do on there, the ones that I kind of use to gauge, you know, where my conditioning is at is either a 10-minute go – so, you know, just got to, you know, max distance in, in calories in 10 minutes. Or I'll do just a one mile for time. And I think that was the one I posted the other day that you asked me about, you know, the calibration. Yep. So I just finally got my one mile time under um, under two minutes, which is the first time I've ever done that. I think I can't remember what I had to hold RPM-wise. It was like 80, 82, something like that for two minutes. Nice. And I mean, man, just it, – it literally two minutes about ruined my day after that. I was hurting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so – but now I might, I might do some 30 second goes today. I haven't done those in a while. I like it. When you do, do you have a certain RPM that you try to hold when you go for that four mile um, in 10 minutes? Yeah. So if I do, if I'm doing it, like if I just want to do it as a warm up before I lift or before I do something else and I want to just hit a steady four mile in 10 minutes, then I got to hold right around 65. That's what I now, figured, if I'm trying yeah. to like If I'm trying to max out and go as hard as I can, or, you know, then I try to hold it right around 70. 70 is an RPM that I can hold for 10 minutes and that'll get me like maybe 4.3 miles yeah but it'll be like when that 10 minutes is done i'm dead so yeah <laughs> you know so 65 is doable and still be able to train after but if i want to you know just bury myself i try to hold it at 70 71 and i can do that for 10 minutes but it's tough so i think, I think have, my best i think i've hit 4.4 is my best do you ever have any of the athletes like I see that, uh, like, Miles and those guys are over there training with you here and there at old school. What do you What do you usually – do you ever put them through that to see kind of what their gauge is? So, with, with Miles and Nate now, you know, I don't do as much conditioning with them. You think of those guys, they're, they're kind of closer to the finished product now, you know? Yeah. They're 23, 24 years old. It's different than when they first came into OSU and I'm working with them and they're 18, 19. You know, Miles was like a kid. Yeah, you know, he hadn't ever, ever really lifted weights or anything like that. So with those guys now, it's just a little bit more, you know, fine tuning, you know, strength wise. We don't do a ton of volume. We'll do whatever our main movement is, you know, whether it's a deadlift movement or some type of like a Zercher squat or something like that. We'll yeah. do a couple of strength accessories. And then we might do, you know, a conditioning circuit at the end, but it's usually more functional stuff, sleds and carries and stuff. And so I don't do as much. You know, conditioning with them, those guys, they they might do some stuff on the bike on their own. You know, with Nate, um, we were doing – when I was doing conditioning with him, we would do more running stuff. So we were going to run in the stadium and doing stuff like that. Yeah. So, but if, you, if you're going to get that – and you can beat them, I think you can beat Nate and Miles on a bike workout. <laughs> that's, all, that's, that's all that matters, though, is somebody that's training for a world title and training for the Olympics – it's always good because those are the those are the top notch athletes in the U.S. So if you can keep up with them in anything, it's it's always something to hang your hat on. That's why I always wonder what those guys are doing. Yeah, I don't know. I'll have to um, I'll have to put one of them on that ten minute challenge and see what they got. You know, Definitely. so a lot of times, a lot of times when they come out to old school, it's just they come out for their strength work. So we don't do as much conditioning after. They might do their conditioning at the RTC, but the RTC doesn't even have Airdynes now. They have some kids regular water lights but they don't have any air dyes so but i, I might have to uh yeah miles on one of those <laughs> to see what he got i'm gonna, I'm gonna go with Heck either yeah. one beat me or you though i don't think so i don't think so either but it's always good i mean 
I don't really consider myself out of the game just because I have to be in a different type of shape for fights, but I still uh, – I still think that wrestling shape is the best shape if you're uh, well-rounded with what training you're doing. Yeah, I think it's, you know, that's one of the things you always hear people asking, you know, current fighters, you know, what was the hardest thing you've ever done? Would you say wrestling's harder than fighting or boxing and all the other kind of little things that you've done? Like training Yeah, body, definitely. Training, like if, oh yeah, like competing, like just in practice, I think just going to a wrestling practice is way harder than going to a jiu-jitsu practice or a boxing practice or, I mean, anything else that you can think of. I think wrestling is definitely the most demanding on your body compared to all those put together. So what? So competing-wise, what do you think about, you know, a 25-minute, you know, five-round title fight? So 25 minutes of work, plus so really spread out over 30 minutes versus a seven-minute college wrestling match? Which one's tougher? Which one's more mentally and physically draining? Um, I guess it depends. I would say because comparing seven minutes to 25 is tough, but you can definitely get more tired in a seven-minute wrestling match than a 25-minute fight, depending on the amount of damage you take in the fight compared to a wrestling match where it's just – there's no break in a wrestling match. In a fight, you have – like a one minute flurry or you have um, you have like a big scramble that happens and then the action stops for a little bit. So like in a fight, there, there's never like a five minute fight in each round. There's always like a there's probably like there's some ebbs, to, ebbs and flows to it. Exactly. Because there has to be a rhythm for it to be a good fight. But also there's it's not going to be constant beating on each other for five minutes or else the fight's not going to make it more than one round. <laughs> right. And it, it's kind of like that in boxing too. Even when you think about pro boxers that fight, you know, 12 rounds, they fight 12 three minute rounds, but there's like, you know, there might be four or five rounds in the middle of the fight where not a lot happens. There's a lot of dancing and stuff like that. And when you see the, you know, if you see two boxers come out and they really engage the whole time, either a, it, the fight's over very fast. Exactly. Or it goes down. Like, you know, kind of like maybe like a Mickey Ward and Arturo Gotti fight where it's legendary, where people will talk about it 100 years from now because you don't see fights like that where guys just are throwing bombs for 45 minutes. It just doesn't happen. Very exactly. Often. So, all right. Yeah, man, that's well, definitely true. I mean, you can't really – like, it's not about keeping a pace either. It's just about how much damage you're really physically able to take in one fight. And I think that it's different for everybody, but – I mean, you look at Mayweather, he doesn't take barely any damage in any of his fights. But also, if he were to take damage like that, we don't know if he would be undefeated. And that's why guys that fight like that, like I don't like to get hit in fights, and I, I train not to get hit. And I train, I train to win. I train to hit without getting hit. And there's not a lot of – I mean – not everybody is like that. There's guys that just go in there and they're like, whatever happens, happens. But <laughs> I mean, I like, that's not really good for the longevity of your career or your brain, really, you know? No, it, it 100% isn't. But guys that fight like that, they just, that's how they've always wanted to fight. And that's the way they go about it. But that's definitely never been my style of fighting, that's for sure. No, I, I think you've done a, a really good job of evolving your striking to go in. You know, good head movement, good good footwork, land some punches, take the guys down, rough them up. I mean, I think it's – you really adapt your style well to it, and that's why you can still form complete sentences too, you know? Yeah, I think that's a big difference. A lot of people don't have that – A lot. I don't know if it's just skill or if it's mental, but I think a lot of my mental game is set for that. Like, I know that I'm smart enough to not get hit, so why go in there and just make it a brawl when I don't need to? All that does is make it a 50-50 fight when if I go in and fight my fight, it's 90% me, and that guy only has a 10% chance of beating me or something like that. That's how I always go into my fights, thinking that way. Right. All right, man. Well, listen, I tell you what, it was good chopping it up with you. I'm glad you jumped on today. It's good seeing you. Heck, yeah. And, uh, it was awesome. Probably be a while before we can actually get a lift in or anything like that, but – Next week, or later this week, if it's nice, why don't we hook up and do some uh, social distance sprinting at Hoover Dam? You down Definitely. With that? I, heard that, I heard that place is packed right now, so we'll have to figure out a good time. 
Yeah, we probably have to go. I'm guessing early. You know, I think most yep. people are quarantined or sleeping in a little bit now, so we could just go sunrise sprints just like we used to do. Heck yeah, sounds good with me, man. All right, man. Good talking to you. Be safe out there. You too. I'll see you soon. Later. Later.